Good morning. We'll call to order the, uh, the Energy Committee hearing. We are here this morning to hear uh, testimony on S883, the American Mineral Security Act of 2015. It's nice to be able to welcome everyone to the committee here this morning. This, this is an important topic, I think, for us, the mineral security of our nation, which directly affects everything from our economic competitiveness to our national security. This is the third Congress now that I have introduced legislation on this subject. I think this is the best version yet, um, but I also believe that passage of this legislation is probably more important now than ever. I've said it before, and I will say it again. I think that we have a real problem on our hands as a result of our nation's borderline insidious reliance on mineral imports. And it's not just the rare earth elements. Uh, 60 Minutes had a, a feature on this some weeks ago. But the reality is, is the United States now depends on many other nations for a vast array of minerals, metals, and materials. And we've got the numbers to back it up. In 1978, the USGS reported that the United States was importing at least 50% of our supply of 25 minerals and 100% of seven of them. According to the latest figures, that dependence is now far deeper. In 2014, we imported at least 50% of 43 different minerals, including 100% of 19 of them. Electric vehicles, solar cells, advanced defense system, you can almost name the technology, almost anything that you can find in modern society. And then you can go look up who we import at least some of the raw materials from. Our foreign dependence is difficult enough, but the concentration of that supply presents additional challenges. Our minerals often come from a handful of countries that are less than stable or who might be willing to cut off our supply to serve their own purposes or meet their own needs. Rare earth elements are, again, probably the best example of this. It's true that our production has picked up, thanks to Molly Kaur out in California, but China still produced 86% of the world's supply in 2014, and close to 60% of our supply was imported. When I look at our foreign mineral dependence and where those minerals are coming from, I see reason after reason to be seriously concerned. It's not hard to foresee a day of reckoning when this will become real for all of us, when we simply cannot acquire a mineral or when the market for a mineral changes so dramatically that entire industries are affected. I'm glad that the Office of Science and Technology Policy is taking up our idea for a critical minerals designations. It's good to see more attention being paid at high levels of government but executive agencies are not as coordinated as they need to be, and they do not have all of the statutory authorities needed to make lasting progress on this issue. And so once again, I've offered a broad bill to rebuild our mineral supply chain. I don't think that there's any substitute for legislation. When it comes to permitting delays for new mines, our nation is still among the worst in the world. We're, we're stumbling out of the gate right at the very start of the supply chain, and we really never catch up, and it's our own fault here. When we decide that a min mineral is critical, we should go survey our lands to determine the extent of our resource base so we know what we can produce right here at home. We should keep working on alternatives, efficiency, and recycling options for the minerals that our nation does not have in significant abundance, and I think that that's a very important part of our discussion here this morning, is we know our we think we know what we have, but again, looking to what alternatives might be reasonable and recycling options are important. We should build out a forecasting capability to provide a better understanding of mineral-related trends and an early warning when problems arise. We also need to ensure a qualified workforce. The United States, we know, is down to just a handful of mining schools. A large share of their faculty will be retiring in the near future, and we need smart young people who want to go out into these fields. This Congress offers a perfect opportunity to bring our minerals policies into the 21st century. My bill offers us that chance. I'd like to thank Senator Heller and Senator Risch for co-sponsoring it, and Secretary Moniz and his team at the Department of Energy for providing technical assistance to us as we drafted it. I also want to thank our panel of witnesses here today. Uh, thank you, Commissioner uh, Fogels, for, for joining us all the way from Alaska here this morning. It's a long haul for you. But uh, again, look forward to the testimony from each of you. And with that, I will turn to my ranking member, Senator Cantwell. 
Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Murkowski, for calling this important hearing on critical minerals. I know you've been dedicated for many years to this subject and seeking to reform federal policy on critical minerals. And this hearing is particularly timely as we work on a bipartisan energy legislation in the committee. The topic today reminds us how integrated the energy sector is with the larger economy and that U.S. energy re uh, renaissance, especially in the growth of clean electricity generation, simply could not happen without critical minerals. From uh, grid storage batteries to wind turbines to catalytic converters to LED lights to crit critical minerals, including rare earth metals, make up the big chunk of clean energy. According to the International Renewable Energy Agency, there are about 625,000 clean energy jobs in the United States. And the independent business group Environmental Entrepreneurs has found that clean energy projects have led to over 230,000 job announcements in the last three years. So every one of those jobs in our new economy has some ties to the mineral supply chain. And so the problem of rare earth metals being hoarded by China remains a pressing problem for our clean energy economy and our national security. It was only a few years ago that China cut its rare earth export quota by 72 percent. When 97 percent of the rare earth metals are produced in China, this amounts to a very serious challenge. Since 2009, the United States has been forced to file trade complaints over China's trade restrictions of minerals, including bauxite, magnesium, zinc, uh, tungsten, and, um, uh, mold, well, something I can't pronounce. Thank you. Would you say that again? Molybdenum. Yes, molybdenum. 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 Thank you. Uh, only at the very last moment, after stretching out the dispute for years, did China comply with trade obligations under the World Trade Organization. In 2010, the European Commission went through an exercise similar to the one outlined in the Chairman's Bill, which proposes that U.S. Uh, Geological Survey establish a critical threshold for various minerals. This is an important step, but I think it's also key to recognize the dynamic nature of these supply chains. As new technologies and manufacturing processes alter these dynamics, the concept of, critical, of critically uh, similar shifts in the marketplace will uh, also generate solutions. So getting this uh, combination right between the public and the private sector initiatives is very important. In addition to pressing for stronger trade enforcement action to protect our supply chain, we can also do more to innovate here at home. If we can accelerate the development cycle for new materials, industry will be better able to navigate around the emerging criticals, whether uh, there are challenges in the marketplace or not. This is part of the important work being done by the Department of Energy Critical Materials Hub, headquartered at Ames, Iowa, Ames Laboratory in Iowa. The hub brings together a number of preeminent institutions in the United States, including Idaho and Oak Ridge National Labs and the Colorado School of Mines. So re recycling is another important component of the strategy, and I think we're going to hear from you, Dr. Um, Sil uh, Silberglit, is that right? Silberglit. Uh, in your testimony, an example of how tungsten, uh, I was struck by the fact that between 2010 and 2011, U.S. manufacturers reduced the imports of this product by uh, one-third through recycling efforts. So we look forward to learning more about that opportunity. And I'm pleased that the introduced version of the bill, of the chair, uh, chairwoman's bill, maintains language about alternatives to critical minerals and the workforce needs, as she just mentioned, uh, because this is also very important. The core function in the bill before us today establishes and maintains a critical minerals list, which Dr. Kimball's agency, the USGS, would be responsible for. So I look forward to hearing what USGS is able to do on the critical minerals within today's existing authority and how the bill would change that. And finally, I, I, I wanted to just make note, um, while I think this is an important act, I continue to believe that we need to do a better job overall of addressing our hard rock mining in the United States. According to the Forest Service, there are new, nearly 2,000 abandoned mines in my state, in Washington alone. And uh, I believe we really need to have a more 21st century view of rock mining program. We should uh, tighten reclamation standards and establish royalty payments like other areas of our natural resource. And I also want to make sure that we're just moving this whole area of critical resources forward in a strategic way. 
So I thank you for uh, holding this important hearing. I look forward to our witnesses today and look forward to asking them questions. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cantwell. Let's, uh, let's go to our witnesses here this morning. We will start uh, with welcoming Dr. Suzette Kimball. Uh, Dr. Kimball is the Acting Director at uh, U.S. Geological Survey. Welcome to you this morning. She will be followed by the Deputy Commissioner, Ed Fogles, from the Office of the Commissioner of the Alaska Department of Natural Resources. Again, thank you for making the trek. We next have Vice Admiral Kevin Cosgriff, uh, President and CEO uh, and of the National Electrical Manufacturers Association, and Mr. Harry Conger, Red <coughs> Conger, President of Freeport McMoran Americas on behalf of the National Mining Association. And uh, wrapping up the panel will be Dr. Richard Silberglit, who is the senior physical scientist at the RAND Corporation. So again, uh, to each of you, welcome to the committee this morning. Dr. Kimball, we will begin with you for five minutes of, of comments. Your full written statement will be included as part of the record, and we will just go down, and then we will ask our, our series of questions. Dr. Kimball, welcome, and we appreciate your leadership at USGS. Well, thank you, and good morning, Chairman Murkowski. Pardon me? No. Better? Uh, good morning, Chairman Murkowski, Ranking Member Cantwell, and members of the committee, and thank you for the opportunity to discuss the American Mineral Security Act of 2015. This bill directs the Secretaries of the Interior and Energy to perform a number of activities intended to support and enhance the nation's critical mineral supply chain, beginning with developing a, me a methodology to determine which minerals are critical to the nation's economy. The Department of the Interior supports the goal of facilitating the development of critical minerals in an environmentally responsible manner. The activities directed by the bill would require resources and also would need to compete for funding with other priorities. The U.S. Geological Survey, USGS, is responsible for conducting research and collecting data on a wide variety of mineral resources. Studies include how and where deposits are formed, the interactions of minerals within the environment, and information to document current production and consumption of about 100 mineral commodities within the United States and around the world. This full spectrum of mineral resource science allows for a comprehensive understanding of the complete life cycle of mineral resources and materials. That is resource formation, discovery, production, consumption, use, recycling, and reuse, and allows for an understanding of environmental issues of concern throughout the life cycle. The Bureau of Land Management, BLM, administers over 245 million surface acres of public land, primarily located in the 12 western states, including Alaska, as well as 700 million acres of subsurface mineral estate throughout the nation. The BLM manages mineral development under a number of different authorities. Each of these authorities, along with BLM regulations and guidance, provides a legal framework for the development of minerals, including critical minerals, on federal and Indian lands. The global demand for crit critical mineral commodities is on the rise, with increasing applications in consumer products, computers, automobiles, aircraft, and other advanced technologies. To better understand potential sources of critical mineral commodities, the USGS has completed studies of known domestic and global rare earth reserves, resources, and uses, which summarize basic geologic facts and materials flow issue related to rare earth element resources, one type of critical mineral. Other USGS studies analyze world trade and supply chains for other critical minerals, including lithium, platinum group metals, and tantalum. In 2014, the United States was 100% dependent on foreign suppliers for 19 mineral commodities and more than 50% dependent on foreign sources for an additional 24 mineral commodities. In 2008, a National Research Council Committee, funded largely by the USGS, developed a criticality matrix that combines supply risk with importance of use as a first step toward determining which mineral commodities are essential to the nation's economic and national security. This has been updated by subsequent studies and ongoing work by the Critical and Strategic Mineral Supply Chain Interagency Subcommittee of the National Science and Technology Council, which is co-chaired by the USGS on behalf of the Department of Interior. S-883 directs the Secretary of the Interior through the Director of the USGS to perform a number of actions that build on current USGS activities and capabilities, including the recent Rare Earths Inventory. 
It also directs the BLM to improve the quality and timeliness of decisions regarding environmentally responsible development of critical material, min, minerals on federal lands. I appreciate the interest this committee has shown on this important issue, and we look forward to working with you as this bill moves forward. The department maintains a workforce of geoscientists with expertise in critical minerals and materials. The department continuously collects, analyzes, and disseminates data and information on domestic and global rare earth and other critical mineral reserves and resources on their production, consumption, and use. The department, through the USGS, stands ready to fulfill its role as the federal provider of unbiased research on known mineral resources, the assessment of undiscovered mineral resources, and information on domestic and global production and consumption of mineral resources for use in the global critical mineral supply chain analysis. The BLM is committed to implementing efficiencies for the environmentally responsible development of critical minerals on federal lands. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present the views of the department on S883, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kimball. Next, let's go to Deputy Commissioner Fogels. Welcome. Thank you, Chairwoman Murkowski, Ranking Member Cantwell, and the honorable members of the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. My name is Ed Fogels, and I'm Deputy Commissioner of the Alaska Department of Natural Resources. And on behalf of Governor Bill Walker, thank you for this opportunity to testify in strong support of the American Mineral Security Act of 2015. I've also been entrusted by the 26 member states of the Interstate Mining Compact Commission to convey their strong support for Senate Bill 883 to the subcommittee and to express their gratitude for your leadership in this area. Senate Bill 883 identifies several important goals for the federal government related to strategic and critical minerals. We strongly endorse all of these goals. The USGS has found that as of 2014, the United States relied on imports for almost all of the 63 identified strategic and critical minerals. Furthermore, our reliance on imports is growing, as is our need for these minerals. Our over-reliance on imported minerals, however, is certainly not due to an absence of resource potential. In fact, many U.S. regions contain significant potential for strategic and critical minerals. With the reforms outlined in Senate Bill 883, this potential in Alaska and the other IMCC member states can be explored. The state of Alaska is blessed with vast mineral potential on its lands. Based on USGS estimates, if Alaska were a country, it would be in the top 10 in the world for coal, copper, lead, gold, zinc, and silver. In addition, Alaska has more than 70 known occurrences of rare earth elements and multiple occurrences of other strategic and critical minerals. Alaska has two exciting projects cur currently in pre-permitting. The Graphite One deposit is the largest graphite deposit in the US, and the Bokan Mountain project contains significant amounts of the heavy or more valuable rare earth elements. The state of Alaska has increased its efforts to incentivize and promote the development of strategic minerals in Alaska. I'd like to briefly touch on three of these lines of effort. First, my department's Division of Geologic and Geophysical Surveys has embarked on a program to better characterize Alaska's mineral endowment. Over the last several years, we have mapped a total of 7.7 .7 million acres, an area about one-third the size of the Commonwealth of Virginia. In addition, we have obtained modern geochemical analyses of nearly 10,000 archived and new samples, and much of this geochemical work has been in cooperation with the USGS. We have been working to make sure this data is readily available to governments, stakeholders, and the public. To this end, we have built a new geologic materials center in Alaska, which contains samples representing over 14 million feet of oil and gas drilling, 300,000 feet of core drilling from mineral projects, and over 200,000 surface samples. Senate Bill 883 will greatly enhance and support these types of efforts and initiatives on both state and federal lands. Second, federal partnerships have been critical to the su success of our mapping efforts. These include the National Cooperative Geologic Mapping Program, the National Ge Geological and Geophysical Data and Preservation Program. We have also partnered with the private sector and Alaska Native corporations to leverage mapping resources. We believe that Senate Bill 883 will encourage these kinds of partnerships. Third, DNR has pursued permitting reform to make our processes more timely, predictable, and efficient. Senate Bill 883 lays the framework for a federal analog. Here are some of our specific initiatives. We are working hard to improve the efficiency of our 
day-to-day -day permitting processes, and we have seen great success and have greatly reduced our permitting backlogs. We have also developed a program for health impact assessments to ensure we can evaluate the potential impacts to human health of our communities, both negative and positive, from development projects. We have been looking for at ways the state can help improve the permitting regime for Clean Water Act Section 404 wetlands authorizations in our state. And we are looking for ways to increase public participation in our permitting process, especially from local communities. And a cornerstone of Alaska's process, which could assist the federal agencies to accomplish the objectives of Senate Bill 883, is our large mine permitting team approach for mining projects. This team-based approach, to our knowledge, is unique in the nation. Applicants can voluntarily enter into an agreement with a state to get a project coordinator who tracks every permit for a project. The coordinator serves as a liaison between the applicant and all of the relevant agencies and the public to provide a single efficient point of contact. The state of Alaska has long felt that the federal counterpart to the state coordinator would vastly improve the NEPA process. We believe that Alaska's efforts to date and those of our other IMCC states can be instructive of how this effort might work on a national scale, and we will continue to be available to share the lessons we have learned. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify uh, before this committee, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner Fogles. Vice Admiral Cos Cosgriff, welcome. Uh, thank you, Chairman Murkowski, Ranking Member Cantwell, members of the committee. Uh, I'm Kevin Cosgriff. I'm the President and CEO of the National Electrical Manufacturers Association. Uh, we represent some 400 electrical equipment and medical imaging technology companies across the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Our combined industries account for more than 400,000 American jobs, some 7,000 facilities across the U.S., and domestic production that exceeds $117 billion per year. We like to think that our industry is at the very forefront of producing safe, reliable, resilient, and efficient electrical energy uh, usable by customers and consumers uh, at all levels. So we'd like to thank you for the opportunity to provide comments in support of Senate 883, the American Mineral Security Act. Challenging supply conditions and corresponding volatile prices of basic mineral inputs can, as you imagine, have significant challenge effects for the U.S. electro industry, as we call our companies, including in sectors such as lighting, electric motors, energy storage, superconducting materials, and medical imaging. Likewise, risks exist in closely related electric intensive businesses, including wind and solar electricity generation, and things like hybrid and electric vehicles. Importantly, while in many cases only small amounts of specific mineral or mineral derivatives may be present in a manufactured component, its presence may be the key performance variable, and in some cases the, the key efficiency variable, uh, as in lighting. When NEMA surveyed our member companies several years ago about the importance of minerals to their products, the, the results were uh, insightful. In addition to well-known usage in the electro industry of elements such as copper, tin, increasingly lithium, we found that many of the so-called rare earth elements are being used by our companies and products they manufacture or have under development for the market. For example, fluorescent and solar state lighting, highly efficient permanent magnet electric motors, and magnetic residence imaging units utilize these materials. Cons consequently, we find the approach taken in S883 contributory to improving the prospects that the U.S. electro industry companies will have access to the minerals and the related information they'll need to be globally competitive in the future. And I would add to that, uh, in addition, uh, the value of having qualified and work-ready individuals to work in these industries. At the end of the day, for us, this legislation is about the government enabling U.S. manufacturers to compete fairly into the future because it will have access to the information, the minerals, 
and the other resources it needs to conduct its business. So thank you again for this opportunity to provide these brief remarks in support of the American Mineral Security Act. I look forward to working with the committee in the days ahead as you move this bill forward. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Admiral. Mr. Conger, welcome. Thank you, Chairwoman Murkowski, members of the committee. My name is Red Conger. I'm president of Freeport McMoran Americas. I'm testifying today on behalf of the National Mining Association. NMA is the National Trade Association representing the producers of most of the nation's coal, metals, industrial and agricultural minerals, manufacturers of mining and mineral processing machinery, equipment and supplies, as well as engineering and consulting firms, financial institution, institutions and other firms serving the mining industry. Today I'm testifying in support of S-883, the American Mineral Security Act of 2015, I want to thank Chairwoman Murkowski for her leadership in introducing legislation to address a key obstacle for the country's economic growth and global competitiveness, a slow and inefficient permitting process for mines that produce the minerals essential for our basic industries, technology, national defense, and the products made here in America. Freeport McMoran's U.S. employees include 8,500 workers in Arizona, 1,600 in New Mexico and 950 in Colorado. They produce copper, molybdenum, and those things that allow Americans to drive safer cars on better roads and bridges, use laptops and smartphones, and, and generally enjoy a high quality of life. Continued growth and demand for minerals and metals is key in, uh, as we see global population grow, uh, rapid industrialization and urbanization in the developing world and a rising global middle class are all driving demand for metals. Most of this growth will occur in the developing world where per capita consumption rates of energy and mineral commodities are just a fraction of what they are in the developed countries. Demand for minerals is also increasing as new frontier technologies require a wider range of minerals and materials. For example, a modern computer chip contains more than half the elements in the periodic table, and even though they may be present in very small amounts, each is essential to function it and the performance of that chip. All of these trends point to sustained growth in global demand and increased competition for mineral resources. As resource competition grows fiercer, stable and reliable mineral supply chains will become more critical here in the United States. Mining's contribution to sustainable economic growth is important in uh, recognizing the connection between minerals and economic growth and have developed strategies to ensure access to the minerals that form the building blocks of their economies and help them compete globally. The European Union's Raw Materials Initiative is designed to ensure a sustainable supply of raw materials. A balanced policy incentivizes and removes obstacles to new mining activities to support the availability of the metals and minerals for the European economy. As the world's largest consumer of many mineral commodities, including copper, zinc, and iron ore, China is giving special attention to its resource security by making global investments to ensure access to supply. When we turn to the U.S., however, we see a lack of urgency. The U.S. is blessed with a world-class mineral resource base with an estimated value of $6.2 trillion. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, when it comes to copper, silver, zinc, and other key mineral commodities, what is left to be discovered in the U.S. is almost as much as what has already been found. Frankly, I'm even more optimistic than the USGS. My experience over my 38-year career suggests we will exceed the USGS predictions in discovering those minerals here at home. However, since the Mining and Minerals Policy Act of 1970, the U.S. has struggled with establishing effective policies to foster and encourage private enterprise in the development of economically sound and stable domestic mining, minerals, metal, and mineral reclamation industries. The lack of enabling domestic policies carries consequences for the competitiveness, competitiveness of downstream industries that depend upon reliable supply chains. Our nation's import dependence for key mineral commodities has doubled over the past two decades. 
Much of our domestic mineral resources remain locked beneath our feet by an outdated and inefficient mining permitting system plagued by unnecessary delays and redundancies at the local, state, and federal levels. NMA urges Congress to work together on enabling policies that ensure timely and responsible access to U.S. mineral and metal resources. If we do not and become increasingly marginalized as a, as a supplier of these essential resources, the consequences are severe for our nation's global competitiveness. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Conger. And finally, let's go to Dr. Silberglid. Welcome. Chairman Markowski, Ranking Member Cantwell, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify this morning. My remarks will be based on a 2013 uh, RAND study for the National Intelligence Council. I'd like first to define critical material. Although the United States has extensive mineral resources and is a leading global materials producer, we depend on imports from many materials that are critical inputs to manufacturing. It, the United States Geological Survey uh, Minerals Commodity Summaries reports that more than 20 materials that are critical inputs to U.S. manufacturing are imported, most at a level greater than 50 percent. These are the critical materials to which I refer. Many of these critical materials are imported from countries that dominate mining and processing often with greater than 50% of global production. Such cases, U.S. manufacturers are vulnerable to export restrictions that limit their access to these materials and that can result in two-tier pricing in which manufacturers in the exporting country have access to materials at lower prices than those charged for exports. This damages the international competitiveness of U.S. manufacturers and creates pressure to move manufacturing away from the U.S. and into the producing country. The dominant producer of greatest concern is China, with more than 50 percent of global production of 11 different critical materials. China built its dominant position with a large resource base, a long-term emphasis on mineral production, and the ability to produce raw materials at lower cost because of its lax environmental and occupational standards. China was once viewed as a reliable low-cost materials supplier. However, in the past decade, China ramped up export restrictions that resulted in distorted markets for these materials, placing our manufacturers into an uneven global competition with Chinese manufacturers who had access to critical materials at lower prices. The United States and its allies successfully challenged these policies before the World Trade Organization. Ever exhausting all allowed time to comply, China finally eliminated export quotas and some export duties. While this is welcome, it remains to be seen whether China will find other ways to provide its manufacturers with competitive advantages based on its position as a dominant producer. What can be done to mitigate these critical materials risks? The RAND report recommended two types of actions. Those that can increase resiliency to supply disruptions or market distortions, and those that can provide early warning of developing problems with concentration of production. Concerning resiliency, the most effective actions will encourage the operation of mines in several different countries. Such diversification is already beginning to take place. However, the uncertainty created by these highly concentrated markets must be overcome by actions at the local, national, regional, and global levels to create a favorable and sustainable climate for the investments and time needed to bring diversified supplies into place. Over the long term, actions to increase resiliency include the development of new and more efficient methods of extraction, processing and manufacturing, increased recovery from waste and scrap, and research and development of alternative materials and new product designs. Concerning early warning, how might we recognize a developing pattern such as an increasing concentration of production, export restrictions, or two-tier pricing before it creates harmful market distortions? The benchmarking of market activity with diversified commodity markets provides a guide. If a critical materials producer seeks a deal that the United States Department of Justice would view in a commodity market as presumed likely to enhance market power, that should be a red flag. When such situations occur, international coordination and cooperation could potentially prevent them from reaching the level of concern that led to the WTO disputes mentioned previously. 
While as an independent and nonpartisan organization, RAND does not take any position on pending legislation, I'd like to note the relation, some aspects of S-883, to our recommended actions. S-883's actions and requirements to expedite permitting relate to our recommended action to diversify production. The section on recycling efficiency and alternatives relates to our recommended actions to increase resiliency over the long term. The section on analysis and forecasting relates to our recommended action on foresight of developing problems and could provide the data for the type of benchmarking against diversified uh, commodity markets that we recommend. Thank you for inviting me to testify. This concludes my formal remarks. I'd be pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Doctor. I appreciate your testimony here, and thank you all for being with us this, this morning. Uh, Dr. Kimball, let me begin with you, um, both in your written testimony and in your, your, your written, you didn't come out right and, and embrace uh, Senate Bill 883. Uh, your written testimony provides that the Department of Interior, quote, supports the goal of facilitating the development of critical minerals in an environmentally responsible manner. Um, and uh, we had an opportunity last year to have Dr. Minert of USGS testify that he was, quote, thrilled and delighted to see our critical minerals legislation. Um, around here, we always like that warm uh, embrace of, of legislation. So uh, yes or no answer to you. Do you think that, that this legislation furthers the goal of facilitating the development of critical minerals in an environmentally responsible manner and increasing the mineral security of the United States? Uh, thank you, Senator. Well, Dr. Minard is here with me today, and I can vouch for the fact that he still is thrilled and delighted. Good. <laughs> um, in terms of a, a, a one-word answer is yes, we do think that uh, the goals embraced in Senate 883 uh, will advance those priorities, and we really commend uh, you and the committee for elevating this very important issue. Well, I appreciate economy. that and know that we want to work with you on this. Let me ask about... Um, this mineral commodity summaries report that you do each year. Um, we've all agreed across the table here that our reliance on, on other countries in terms of, of our mineral needs is increasing. But when, when USGS reports that, um, uh, that we are seeing this increasing foreign mineral dependence, what happens? What happens next? If we're seeing uh, the, the, this matrix go up, do we have a concerted effort within the, the agency, anywhere within the federal government, really, to reduce or then minimize the imports of those minerals where we're seeing this increased reliance? Well, the USGS Mineral Commodities Reports provides essential information that can inform national economic policy and trade uh, considerations. The USGS itself does not uh, enter into those kinds of policy decisions which factor into account economies, factor into account trade uh, considerations and industry uh, capabilities. And so, so you once put we put the summary it, out there, but right. not much further beyond that, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Let me uh, ask a little bit about permitting reform because we've heard from uh, many of you here at the table that, that permitting reform must be addressed. It takes an average of seven to ten years to permit a new mine here in this country. And, and one leading consultancy has found that permitting delays are the most significant risk to mining projects here in this country. Mr. Fogles, you mentioned a couple specifics in the state of Alaska where we have, we've, we've made some headway. I think you refer to the, the large project coordinator where you've got a, a liaison between the applicant and, and all the agencies better coordinating it that way. And we've seen improvements at the state level. What do you hear at the federal level, though, in contrast to what you're doing at, at the state level? And then a follow-on to you, Mr. Conger, is if we were to adopt this type of an approach that the state of Alaska has with this, with this liaison, would this help us with the, with the federal permitting process? Mr. Fogles. OK, thank you, Senator. Um, yes, as I said in my testimony and as um, further elaborated on in my uh, written testimony, we have developed a, a fairly unique process uh, of 
Uh, we've put together our large mine team. Uh, it's been in, uh, in existence for probably close to 20 years now. Um, and, and basically how it works is an applicant will voluntarily decide to sign up with the state of Alaska to get a project coordinator assigned to a specific project. And this isn't limited just to mining projects, but it did start in the mining sector. And then that coordinator will essentially shepherd uh, the process. We'll track every single permit, state, federal, local, try and bring all the parties to the table and be that efficient uh, single point of contact. And, and I think most importantly, it gives the public a real holistic way to look at the process and makes it easier for the, the public to follow along. The process also has a strong cost recovery component where the, uh, the applicant essentially pays for almost all, if not all, the state um, permitting expenses. Uh, and, it, and again, this is um, just for the state side that that cost recovery is, uh, is implemented. Um, we have a statute that gives the Department of Natural Resources that authority to coordinate state agencies. It enabled, has enabled us to build a team with expertise. Uh, mining, the mining sector is very complicated. To permit a mine is a very complicated uh, endeavor. So we have a built up this expertise. On the federal side, um, they don't really have a counterpart to, to our coordinator. And we've long dreamed that someday uh, the federal agency should contemplate something similar. We understand that it's a little more difficult to do something like that on the federal side with a federal family but we still think there's, there's room for the federal agencies to somehow coordinate a little bit better. I think the Canadian national government has a major projects office and that may be something to look at, um, but I think there's- Well, I, I appreciate that. My, my time is up and Mr. Conger, I, I wanted you to just very briefly comment if you think that, that uh, federal application of what we've seen at the state level would, would help us with a more expedited or more efficient permitting process. Chairwoman Murkowski would be very helpful. Okay, good, thank you. Senator Cantwell. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a, a, a couple of different questions, and Dr. Kimball, I just wanted to know from you, what do you think you're currently lacking right now to ensure that there's a stable supply chain of these critical minerals for our economy? And um, uh, Vice Admiral Cosgriff um, uh, wanted to ask you about um, what you've seen that are the best research partnerships uh, with the Department of Energy, again, to lessen the supply chain challenges and disruption. And Mr. Um, uh, Silber -Gitz, uh, Glitz wanted to ask you about the examples of using recycling as alternatives in the supply chain. So obviously this is uh, all about these industries that have to resource and keep this development going. So I just wanted to really hone in on that supply chain with those questions. Uh, thank you, Senator Cantwell. <clears throat> we believe we actually have the uh, adequate existing authorities uh, to undertake the kinds of assessments uh, and resource determinations around the critical minerals uh, supply chain issues. And in fact, life cycle analysis is a fundamental part of our strategic plan for our mineral resources program. Uh, in enabling the USGS to be able to provide the kind of information on the time frame identified, within the time frames identified in uh, Senate 883 will be a challenge under our uh, current uh, funding constraints. Because of the complexity of that or? <clears throat> Not so much because of the complexity, but because of the amount of work that it will take uh, and the uh, number of individuals that will be required to complete those assessments in the uh, time frames that are identified. Don't we already have a report that was done? Right? It's a DOE report. Uh, the DOE report, Critical Materials Strategy. That's a Department of Energy uh, document. Uh, uh, but we the, do share, right? <laughs> yes, we do. And actually, we work very, the Department of Interior and the Department of Energy works very, very closely together on these issues. Uh, Department of Energy is focused more on technology and technological development associated with various industrial applications, whereas we're uh, involved more with understanding the distribution of the resource, both discovered and undiscovered. Research partnerships, Admiral Cos Cosgrove? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, 
Well, the Critical Minerals Institute comes to mind in the context of this hearing and, and what they're working on. And uh, in addition to that, uh, which we welcome, we also have affiliations, our companies have affiliations with universities. Uh, they are, the larger ones are in-house technologists and they're always pursuing technology as a, as a competitive uh, advantage when they can uh, find something the other guys don't have yet. So all of this R&D is gonna be important across the entire life of these minerals uh, from uh, extraction, I'll defer to the gentleman on my left for that, but all the way through their life, their application in the manufacturing process, and then the sunset of that product at the end of life. And a good example is added of that is uh, what NEMA members are doing with, with lighting in uh, a number of states where we recover lights uh, extract minerals that would be environmentally dangerous and dispose of it uh, responsibly. Doctor, on the on the recycling aspect of the supply chain. Th thank you, Senator. Uh, recycling is certainly very important, uh, and uh, it's it's certainly market driven today. And the case study of tungsten uh, that you quoted in your remarks indicates that. Uh, one can respond very rapidly, in fact, in some industries. Uh, the tungsten manufacturer that we talked to uh, pointed out to us that they were already trying to substitute for tungsten as well as they could in cutting tools and uh, using a, uh, as little as possible uh, and using it as, as efficiently as possible. Uh, but then uh, with the uh, problems with the supply chain, they were able to uh, start to recycle uh, scrap and waste uh, at an even greater rate. Uh, the USGS had done a study several years before, uh, Dr. Kim Shedd, uh, and showed that uh, uh, the supply chain for tungsten has places where you can recycle. Uh, and so uh, I, uh, I agree that we should uh, recycle as much as possible. It's a very good alternative. Thank you. Senator Capito. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank the panel. And uh, I'm gonna start with Mr. Conger, please. Uh, most of what we've heard in the, in the panel discussion today has been in support of S883 for the reason I'm gonna ask, uh, in that the permitting process for new mines is very, very difficult to navigate. Generally speaking, you, you mentioned that you'd been in, in this business for several decades. Um, would you say, how does the United States compare to other countries, and we, we touched on this a little bit, uh, when it comes to permitting timelines for new mines? Thank you, Senator. Um, first of all, the, the standards that, that we use throughout the world are, are based on U.S. standards. Most of the, the countries in the West, rest of the world have rapidly adopt the standards for the, the quality and the veracity of the, of the regulations. What, what we find most different is the, the other countries that we work in have specific timelines for various aspects of the permitting process to be uh, completed within, and, and they're, they're adequate time frames, two, three years typically, a lot of public involvement in those, so there's plenty of opportunity for everyone to be informed and arrive at the best, you know, overall outcomes for the for the project. When when we work on permitting here in the United States, there there is absolutely no timeline estimates that you can that you can make. the The most recent uh, property that that we permitted and built from scratch in Arizona took 12 years. To permit, and that there's just there's in many cases no ways to make break the log jams that occur, and just takes a long time. Just so I understand the the semi science of this, and and maybe Dr. Kimball, you can answer this for me uh, on the mineral. Uh, we we've heard that most of the producing and most of the importing is from China. Is that because we don't actually have the minerals here, or is it what? Uh, Mr. Conger was saying that we just investors and and companies aren't investing here because of the uncertainty of the uh, the regulatory issues. Do we have these minerals here? Could we be dominating in this in this field? I, I think there's a combination of factors. Uh, in some cases, we do not have 
uh, adequate resources to meet our needs mm -hmm. uh, in, in uh, domestically. Uh, in other cases, uh, there are industry considerations in terms of practicality mm -hmm. of uh, extracting those resources. And in some cases, we have not completely mapped the full extent of uh, the resources uh, nationally, so we aren't able to make uh, an assessment. So there are a number of factors that complicate. So would contributing on the last point that you made in, in terms of that we haven't adequately mapped, is that because we haven't placed a great enough priority on it? Is it because the supplies there from other countries? How would you, how would you perceive that? Um, again, uh, there are a number of factors that affect that. We, in fact, have uh, done national assessments on a number of uh, minerals, critical, some criti mm -hmm. identified as critical materials, some other metals, copper and zinc come to mind as ones where we have done national assessments. Uh, there is uh, a uh, timeline and a workload uh, commitment associated with that. Uh, we've been very fortunate to have very good working relationships with industry, with other federal uh, agencies, and uh, with uh, the university communities. Mm -hmm. uh, but that uh, coordination to move forward uh, in a national context is not only complex, but it's a, a very, very large Mm -hmm. uh, workload. Does the state of Alaska do your own mapping exploration? Or, I mean, do you, do you feel like this is a necessary for us to move forward? Do we have to have the federal or could we do it statewide with the federal sort of overseeing in terms of discovery? Uh, absolutely, Senator. Um, the state of Alaska does do its own mapping, uh, very heavily uh, partnering with the federal agencies such as the right. USGS. But I should make a point that as of today, we have mapped 17% of Alaska, 17%, and the at a scale that's, that's that's suitable for mineral exploration, and the remaining unmapped acreage in Alaska is equal to the states of Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, and Arizona combined. You could probably even stick West Virginia in a little corner there and still so. still be accurate. Let me just make a, a, a quick question. Somebody might be able to answer this in a yes or no. Uh, my, my perception of these types of minerals is that they're very expensive to purchase and could be a very lucrative business uh, if we would uh, get together, uh, use this um, uh, law to better coordinate and expedite our regulatory uh, regime here. Is, is that true? Are most of them very expensive or not? Yes. Senator Capito, I, I think there would be more people exploring and looking for minerals if they knew that they could bring it to fruition and produce them. That, that there's just a huge barrier to entry with the uncertainty of how long it's going to take to permit. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Franken. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in uh, 2013, I was uh, a co-sponsor of the Chair's Critical Mi uh, Minerals Policy Act, and I believe that bill was able to strike a balance between supporting domestic critical mineral production and doing so in an environmentally responsible way. We continue, uh, need to continue to make sure that mining activities which are, are vital to local economies are carried out in a manner that is consistent with protecting uh, the public health, welfare, safety, our national security, and the environment of the United States. And I'm not sure why these considerations get less attention in the legislation that has been introduced in this new Congress. Dr. Kimball, in your opinion, have environmental impacts of extracting critical minerals lessened over the last two years? Uh, Senator, I don't, I'm not qualified to answer that question in terms of uh, whether or not the impacts have lessened due to changes in technology or industry practices. I can say that it's a very important issue. Uh, mineral uh, any extractive industry development uh, and environmental protection are not mutually exclusive goals. And so that a, a good understanding of the resource distribution, a good understanding of how technology can be applied and what the potential uh, environmental impacts might be due to that extraction uh, can work 
th those entities can work cooperatively together for an effective. Uh, I think they have to. I mean, they're not mutually exclusive. They're intrinsically tied together. Uh, in our efforts to increase the domestic production of critical minerals, shouldn't we be concerned with doing it in a way that really pays uh, due attention to health, safety, and the security of communities and the environment as well? Anybody? Senator, if I may, um, we, we have the, the best uh, regulatory regime in, in the world for those kinds of things, and I would submit that the minerals coming from China, for instance, are not being extracted with near the care and attention to the environment that we do here in this country. And so I think the best thing for global population overall is for us to do it under our standards. As you said, they're intrinsically linked between our, our security interests and our ability to do it uh, the best anywhere in the world. Well, in the prior version of the bill, um, in the previous Congress, it included substantial funding, about $15 million, for research to look at things like recycling and other alternatives to limit the overall environmental impacts of min mineral extraction. And I think that we should continue to lead the world in, in that. I think that's, that's good for Americans. And I think we can do both. Uh, but the bill doesn't include any specific authorization for these programs, and it's something I'd be interested in working with, with the chairman on. Uh, Dr. Silberglit, as you noted, rare earth metals are critical to the high-tech sector and the energy sector, but we also know that in many cases we are dependent on imports from China, as testimony cited. In, in recent years, uh, we've seen large price increase uh, for these rare uh, earth elements, and we need to make sure that our, our dependency doesn't harm our, our manufacturing sector. I know that there is a real risk when it comes to developing clean energy uh, technologies. Uh, Dr. Silberglit, uh, can you talk about which particular clean energy technologies are most dependent on rare earth elements? Thank you, Senator. Um, the report that uh, the senator just held up from the Department of Energy goes into that in, in, in a lot of detail. Uh, and uh, many of the renewable energy uh, technologies, such as wind uh, energy, uh, uh, rely on uh, and, and more energy efficiency uh, uh, projects, such as using uh, uh, substitutes for incandescent lighting. Uh, phosphors are important. so. There, there are a host of uh, new energy technologies, as the Department of Energy and its national labs have documented, uh, that are for which uh, the rare earths are very important. Well, I see my time has uh, run out, so I'll maybe include a couple of extra questions for the record. And thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, thank you, uh, Mr. Conger. According to recent studies. Metal mining in Montana has contributed $403 million, that was his 2012 numbers in tax revenues, and non-metal mining contributes $128 million. That includes $288 million of state and local taxes. Metal and non-metal mining has created nearly 20,000 jobs in Montana, including 8,500 direct jobs. These are good paying jobs. And in fact, in Montana, we know this balance between developing our natural resources with responsible environmental stewardship is the only option as access to our state's one of a kind public lands is crucial to our state's tourism economy and our very way of life. It's critical that mining operators in Montana are engaged, engaged members of the community and responsible stewards of the resource. In fact, in the Stillwater Mining Company, mining one of only two of the platinum and palladium resources in all of North America, recently received BLM's Hard Rock Mineral Community Outreach and Economic Security Award in October of 2014. I visited the operation. Uh, these are great jobs. They do so much for the community. And this mining is occurring right in the backdrop of the Absaroka Beartooth Wilderness Area. And these miners work during the week 
and they're backpacking, they're fishing, they're climbing mountains, they're hiking on the weekends. It's a, it's a great example of that, that, that balance that we seek. The question I have is I'm told your company also has an excellent reputation for investing in the communities where its mines are located, including partnering to foster sustainability. Could you tell me more about your company's initiatives in that area? Thank you, Senator Danes. And you know, we're certainly proud to have Stillwater Mining as a member of the National Mining Association. So congratulations on those on those achievements. Uh, at, at Freeport MacMoran, it's it's very important that the people in, in the areas where we live and work understand the, the true benefit of having us as a neighbor versus us not being there. And, and there's no question we, we have an impact on the environment. We know that we do a variety of things to ameliorate those impacts. But in the areas of uh, education, health, community development, we were strong supporters of local communities. We, we give generously to uh, things that meet those criteria, education, health, et cetera, uh, in the form of projects at schools, scholarships, uh, infrastructure in, in cities and towns, and things that, that make sense for, for us and, and the people where we live and work. Um, we've also seen, however, in Montana, uh, there have been some mining projects that have been burdened by extensive permitting processes that are keeping these job-creating projects from moving forward valuable investments in the communities. A couple that come to mind are the Rock Creek Mine and the Montanor Mine, which have been undergoing extensive permit analysis for several years. The Montanor Mine is up in Lincoln County, up in the northwest part of our state. When I was going to high school, Libby was a double-A high school. We're a double-A high school, my hometown of Bozeman. Libby next year moves down from, they've gone from double-A to A, they're moving to class B next year. And that's really, uh, I think, uh, the, the story of what's going on with some of our communities are dying with high unemployment rates, very low incomes. Uh, there's been truly uh, extensive, almost analysis by paralysis going on for several years on these projects. Uh, could you expand more on the on-ground impact that the slow permitting process has had for members of the National Mining Association? Senator Daines, in, in general, you, you can't make a business plan w without some kind of estimate of timing of, of in investment itself, of activities, when, you know, when do we hire engineering, when do we hire construction, when do we hire permanent employees, and the, you know, the key to all of that is being able to have the permits to, to proceed. So when, when there is no surety of how that process is going to work and there are plenty of opportunities for it to be stalled and delayed uh, you know people can't count on anything you can't if if this the communities that you mentioned their their people would like to go to work there at those operations but they, they don't have any idea when that might be able to take place as we say in montana we work where we also like to play yeah. But if you don't have a job, the only folks will be playing in Montana are tourists come from out of state because Montanans no longer can afford to raise their families there unless we need these jobs. Thanks for your comments. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Madam Chair, I'd like you to allow Senator Manchin to go before me since he has a markup to attend. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank all of you. Uh, I think we all know the uh, constraints that we have uh, producing the uh, minerals that this country depends on and needs. Uh, I come from West Virginia, as you know, and West Virginia has been challenged in so many ways. And uh, we have consistently found better ways to do things, better ways to find a balance between the economy and the environment. There has to be a balance. Uh, with that being said, under the Strategic and Critical Mineral Stockpiling Act, the Department of Defense is responsible for stockpiling critical minerals. In fact, one of the stockpiles used to be in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. An unbelievable site, deep water port, both rail lines coming in, CSX, Norfolk Southern, and it just disappeared. CS, GSA disposed of it all. So I would ask a, a question to all of you concerning the, uh, uh, of our defense and our economy, the defense of our nation, 
and the economy that we depend on and all of us live our life. Do you believe the United States is positioned right now and we have sufficient rare earth minerals to do the job that we need done in this country to defend it and to sustain the economic growth that we need? Or have we become more reliant on others, the outside world? And all I can speak about is I've seen all the other countries buying up the minerals in West Virginia. People don't realize basically our best metallurgical coal has been bought up by Russia and uh, India and China. It continues. I'm sure it continues in other hard rocks. But and if you all can just very quickly on that one talk about do you believe we're in a position to defend ourselves from the economic and the defense that we should be by having strategically either control or ownership of rare earth minerals? And we'll just start right down the line. Uh, Dr. Kimball. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, well, of course, the USGS does not um, engage in those kinds of analyses, and so uh, I, I don't uh, feel that we're qualified to determine whether or not... You all, you all have not looked at the inventory. You haven't looked at basically what we have in this country, who the ownership is, and what the production levels are? Uh, through our mineral, mineral commodities analyses, yes, we have, but we have not put that in terms of could, what is... Could you get us a report on that? And the only thing I want to know, are we dependent on other countries, or do other countries have control of our minerals, which we're dependent on for our economic and the defense of our nation? So if you could give me an answer on that, I would really appreciate it. Uh, we'll provide uh, information for the record. Will that be suitable? Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Fogel? Yes, Senator, thank you. Um, I guess I would have to say no, we're not prepared to... Uh, uh, supply ourselves with what we need. You think right now that we're dependent strategically on the things it takes for the quality of life we have in defending our homeland, that we cannot take care of ourselves right now without outside rare earth? Uh, absolutely. I firmly believe that, um, but I believe that we have the potential to turn that around. Do you have any, you know. do you have any uh, statistics on that or any info that can back that up, basically saying that we are not in a position today to self-sustain ourselves or take care of ourselves? Um, I think it's out there. I think we can... Can you put that together put that for that me? Together? Sure. Okay, Vice Admiral. I think what my members look for more than anything else is predictability. And for the most part, in a globalized market, uh, no matter where these minerals reside, uh, in the main right now, it's predictable. But so you I think, think basically we have either ownership or control as the United States? I think it's a predictable source of minerals for my company that they need in manufacturing. But I think as the West Coast port problem showed, uh, as, as a one-off example of how quickly disruption can oh, ripple I, through the yeah. economy. So um, as a, I'm not a miner, I don't know the, the geology of this, but as a, as a representative of manufacturers, they're looking for predictability and affordability in their supply. I think my question goes deeper, basically saying that the, the hard, the, the challenges we have through regulatory of being able to produce the rare uh, minerals that we depend upon make us more dependent, that we have less control is what I'm trying to say. And that's what I'm trying to, if you all have the expertise and everything, we've got to make sure that the people in the United States of America, 300 plus million, understand that we're not in a position to take care of ourselves, either over, uh, over regulations or a uh, lack of, of uh, inventory or dependency on countries that basically could shut us off in a heartbeat. We know what we're talking about is China about them being very aggressive in the world market, correct? And Red, you might have any comments on this. Yes, yeah, Senator Manchin, thank you. Um, in a word, no, we're, we're not self-sufficient. We could be more independent. Uh, to be direct about your question, National Mining Association will provide you with that data thank and that you. backup information. Mr. Silbergood. Thank you, Senator Manchin. Uh, I think the key uh, words that we've heard today uh, from from my colleagues here are access and uncertainty and predictability. And so we have these world markets for materials, and the rare earths are a perfect example, where we don't have control, where we depend on imports. And if that market were a fair marketplace and our companies could have access at the same price that anyone else would pay, then I think we would have no problem. We don't have to control it ourselves, but that isn't currently the case, as we said in our report. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't subscribe here to throwing caution to the wind. I think there's a balance between the economy and environment. We have a responsibility, but also we're very 
vulnerable, I think, and that's what I'm concerned about. And I want to thank Senator Rono very much for allowing me to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Manchin. I think your questions get right to the heart of why we want to have this legislation, because there is a vulnerability, and uh, it is very real. So, Senator Hirono, thank you for generously letting your colleague precede you. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a question for Vice uh, Admiral Cosgrove. We've heard testimony today on the limited supply of critical minerals uh, that are in products that rely, we rely on every day from smartphones to toothpaste to vehicles. As a consequence, our landfills are filled with products containing critical minerals. And looking at the testimony from Dr. Silberglit that, that in the tungsten situation, the um, uh, industry responded relatively quickly to producing through secondary production of tungsten, through recycling, uh, filling a need. So my question, uh, Vice Admiral Cosgrove, is what percentage of electrical equipment containing uh, rare earth minerals is recycled across your members, and what are the impediments you see to increasing recycling rates? And uh, for the rest of the panel, anyone who wants to weigh in, uh, what you know, is recycling of critical minerals from the products that are already containing these minerals feasible? And what can we do at the federal level to incentivize recycling of these products containing these minerals? So let's start with you, uh, Vice Admiral Cosgrove. Thank you, Senator. I can't give you a, a percentage of, of products that have critical uh, minerals in it or the percentage of of recycling therein, uh, we will do our best. It's to probably get, not very much. Well, we will do our best say. to get that information to the mm -hmm. to the committee because I think it's a very good question and a very right question about the responsibility we all have, you know, suppliers, manufacturers, and users to make sure at the end of life of these products, for environmental reasons and increasingly for uh, other reasons, in this case, the rarity of a of a key substance in that product, to do our level best to recover that. I know in manufacturing we spend a lot of time trying to, trying to wring inefficiency out of our processes. Waste is an inefficiency. You wouldn't want to waste something with the word rare in it. So uh, that's an important part of it. But likewise, at the end of life, teaming with, with consumers and other users, we recover those materials as best we can. There are programs to do that. DOE incentivizes that. States do that. Uh, there is some research being done on that. Uh, I would encourage the, uh, and congratulate the committee on addressing that whole life cycle approach to these products, uh, these materials. You say that there are already federal incentives to uh, recycling? In the, in the case of uh, not for, uh, the ones I'm familiar with are for environmental reasons for uh, recovering materials and lighting systems, and I will find out on the critical materials from the manufacturer's point of view. Do any of the other panelists want to weigh in on how feasible is it to recycle uh, more of the products to uh, get <laughs> critical mi minerals out of these products? Sen Senator yes. Rono, uh, thank you. Um, Hunger. One, one thing that I would point out uh, in, in the case of copper, w which is well, well documented, and uh, copper has been mined and produced for over 4,000 years. Mm -hmm. Estimates have been made that 99% of all the copper that's ever been extracted from the Earth's surface is still in use today, and and we track that annually. It's it's uh, an integral part of the supply <coughs> cycle of copper. Uh, wires, you know, get you tear down something that has copper wires in it. For instance, or an old motor, you take that, put it back into the mm -hmm. into the supply chain, uh, and that that ends up constituting about 10% of the total marketplace. So what what I would point out is, yes, recycling is important. We need to continue to uh, encourage people to recycle and and facilitate recycling, but it's not going to replace the growing demand that mm -hmm. that the world's population has for all of these. Things that that it's it's part of it, but it's not sufficient to not yes. not have new mines. I, und I understand that, but I think recycling probably should could play a bigger role in our in, in our need for these critical elements. Uh, 
I have another question about, um, you know, the Department of Energy in 2011 uh, and under Chair Murkowski's bill would require the DOE to identify and develop alternative minerals and energy technologies that are less reliant on minerals that could face supply restrictions. So uh, perhaps, uh, again, Vice Admiral Cosgrove, you can uh, let us know how much progress has been made within the manufacturing industry on finding these alternative minerals and manufacturing techniques that would be less dependent on crit critical minerals. How are we progressing on that? Yeah, I think the, the thing to remember there, Senator, is that our companies pursue technology for competitive advantage. And so they're always trying to find that, that uh, that, that special something that's gonna give them a leg up. Uh, pick on lighting again, in the case of, of LEDs, we do use uh, these uh, rare earth elements to help us tune the light to get the right colors, to get the right mix of colors so that white looks like white light looks like white light to your eyes and not some off shade that drives consumers crazy. Right now, that's the rare earth uh, component of LEDs. In the future, I can't say, but, but it's an example of where technology got us to a point where we are reaping tremendous energy savings with these new devices. And I think it's logical to think that our, our companies will continue to pursue alternatives to something that's going to be expensive to source, rare earth elements. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. As we've discussed this morning, the innovative use of minerals is expanding rapidly from advanced defense technology to cutting edge clean energy developments. New uses are cropping up with increasing frequency. We depend on these valuable materials every day for components in uh, phones, computers, roads, and that means we count on having a steady supply of them. For many of these minerals, we know that's not a problem. We know that our manufacturers and researchers will have access to them at reasonable prices for the foreseeable future. But for others, we don't have much choice except to use unreliable foreign sources and to accept the risks that come along with that. That's why it is so important that we invest in developing alternatives to critical materials and finding other ways to reduce our reliance on overseas suppliers. Northeastern University in Boston, for example, has conducted important research on rare earth minerals, focusing on potential substitutes for these minerals in ultra-strong magnets that are now used in everything from hybrid cars to headphones to jet engines. Dr. Silberglit, given how reliant we are on importing critical minerals, can you explain how high quality research can reduce the risks associated with supply shortages and disruptions? Thank you, Senator Warren. Uh, well, uh, research can uh, reduce the risks in several ways. Uh, one is to uh, reduce the amount that we use uh, um, simply by uh, using a material that, using the same material more efficiently mm -hmm. with a better product design. And this is going on in, in the uh, tungsten industry for many years. Uh, and it's accelerated because of the uh, situation you described. Uh, another is... Uh, you know, to be more efficient in the way we actually produce these materials, right? We talked about uh, better ways to, uh, to actually produce the material, to do it in a more environmentally sound way, uh, to process it more efficiently so that we uh, essentially get more out of what's in the ground, right? And uh, another uh, possibility is to substitute one material for another I believe the research you quoted mm -hmm. uh, talks about using cerium, which is a very uh, a much more abundant uh, and less uh, uh, less supply risk risky uh, material than uh, neodymium and uh, dysprosium, which are uh, the ones that uh, are quite a bit of a problem, according to the Department of Energy, for example. So there are all these different ways, and I think we need to uh, like with energy. Uh, it's not one versus another. You need them all. So I think we need to pursue all of those. Good. Well, that's very valuable to talk about the different ways in which research can be helpful in this area. And Dr. Kimball, 
what mineral needs does our country have that we might be able to help address with better investments in research? Can you just give us an idea of that? Uh, Senator, are you asking what specific minerals we should be pursuing? Uh, or general areas where we should be working? Uh, well, uh, I think one of the most important things is really looking at the life cycle uh, analysis of various minerals where we know that there is demand uh, through industry. Uh, and some of those minerals are included in the list that has been referenced several times this morning, uh, where we do have uh, foreign dependents. Part of the challenges uh, that we as a nation face is to not become too dependent on a single source for any particular uh, commodity, but to understand uh, the distribution so that uh, if there is disruption in those commodities, uh, that in the supply of those commodities, that our needs are not put at risk. And so I think that's another valuable area for research. Good. That, that, that's, that's very important. Thank you. You know, I realize that investments in high-quality research can't solve all our problems. But this research represents a very important opportunity to reduce our reliance on unreliable foreign mineral sources. We can do a better job of developing alternatives to critical minerals, strengthen our research workforce, and explore other ways to improve our resilience to supply disruptions. And our nations and other re uh, research institutions can play a critical role in that process. I'm pleased that the bill we're talking about today takes steps to address these concerns, and I look forward to working with the chairman on this. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Warren. Good discussion here this morning about understanding what it is that we have, um, the analysis, the assessments, um, and, and, and then trying to, to forecast out what it is that we will need, how we can be more efficient in our use, how we can recycle, how we can find alternatives. I want to go back to you, uh, Mr. Fogels, with a follow-on to Dr. Kimball, just in terms of the mapping. You've indicated that 17% uh, of the state of Alaska has been mapped, and, and uh, we have a long ways to go in understanding what it is that we have available to us. I would imagine that we are in a similar situation um, around the country, just in terms of, of having a a, a mapping and an understanding uh, of the resource across the country. Uh, obviously, the, no, the more we know, uh, the, the better prepared we are. How do we go about placing a priority then on, on mapping? Um, we've, we've had a difficult time just getting an inventory of, of many of our, of our oil and gas resources. This, in my view, this kind of falls in that same category. Is it something, and I think this goes to Senator Capito's point, where if the federal government isn't doing it, we rely on the states to do it, how, how do we do a better job in terms of the assessment? Yeah, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, I think, as, as, as we all know, a lot of you have heard Alaska's um, financial situation at this point, given the low oil prices, probably won't let us contribute as much to our mapping effort as, as we once have, for, at least for the time being. We hope that And gets so if we there. don't have the mapping, does that mean that we, we have investors that are just not looking at us because they don't know? Well, again, we, we've done a, a, lot, a, a lot of really good work on our mapping, and so already state mapping data has enabled us to find two significant prospects in Alaska, the Pogo Gold Mine, uh, which is producing right now, and the Live and Good Project, which is a fabulous project that's uh, in pre-permitting. Um, both of those were uh, discovered, at least uh, in part, because of the state release of data. We have other projects, such as the Richardson Highway area, where a company recently staked 23,000 acres of mining claims based on, on state data. So existing state data is still driving, um, you know, driving investment in Alaska, and will continue to do so. Uh, we're just what about on the federal side? If we've got 17% of our state lands that have been mapped, how much of our federal lands have been mapped? Um, 
Actually, I think the the seventeen percent figure that I mentioned was all of Alaska it state, okay. federal, okay. Uh, and probably even private Native corporation land. So I don't have the, the actual break up uh, breakout right. percentage by land ownership. But I mean, we we definitely need to do more, and we're looking for innovative ways to partner with the federal agencies, such as the USGS, to to keep that rolling. And for a while now, anyway, we'll have to rely more on the on the federal agencies to. Uh, to help us with that mapping. Then let me ask you, Dr. Kimball, are, are we giving sufficient priority just to the assessment and mapping in your view? I, I, I think that we could put more effort into developing those baseline assessments. And uh, as we've talked a lot today about how technology is driving a need for critical minerals, uh, uh, advances in scientific technology can help us with those assessments and mapping. Uh, new techniques uh, for using hyperspectral technology, for instance, which is being pioneered right now domestically in Alaska, has the provides us with the opportunity to be looking at larger areas, especially those that are inaccessible uh, to the usual boots on the ground prospecting types of good. Then let me ask about this uh, early warning system that uh, you referenced, Dr. Sil Silgerblit. Um, your, your report contains this index that approximates the global con concentration of production for critical uh, raw materials. Can this type of an index then serve as some kind of an early warning system for, for problems um, related to concentration of, of production? Because it seems to me, you know, it, look, this is, this is expensive to produce. You've got long lead times. If we can see it coming, Perhaps we can be a little more proactive here. Is that is that a fair uh, fair observation? Thank you, Senator. Uh, there are uh, two indices that we used in our report. One is the uh, Herfindahl Hirschman index, the HHI, which is commonly used for commodity markets, and it shows you if you see that's uh, becoming more concentrated, then you see that there is uh, producers that are dominating the market. The other uh, we we uh, folded into that HHI index uh, the world governance indicators that the World Bank produces to look to see if the dominant producer is indeed one that has a poor governance or that controls their, their market so that we need to worry more about that. I think that both of those indices can be used uh, if you benchmark them against commodity markets. So if you look at the changes in those indices, and you ask yourself, if I were the Department of Justice and this were a commodity market, would I worry about mm -hmm. this? So yeah, that will give you some foresight and that kind of benchmarking can suggest where there might be a problem evolving. If we had done that years ago when we saw the Chinese growth right. in all these different markets, we would have said maybe, gee, this could be a problem eventually. But uh, I think that uh, Forecasting can be a problem too, right? Because there's so much uncertainty in these markets. They can change very rapidly as we've seen with the rare earths and with other materials. So I think one has to take those forecasts with a grain of salt, use them as a guide. I like to do foresight rather than forecasting. Look at what's plausible and what the range of uncertainty is. And then yes, these indices can give you benchmarks that might enable you to see when a problem could occur. Let me ask you, uh, Admiral Cosgrove and, and Mr. Conger, or others, if, if, uh, if, if we were better able to, to forecast or to, to operate with foresight, as, as Dr. Silberglit has, has mentioned, does that help us here from a manufacturing perspective? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, the predictability, that uh, enhanced predictability that comes with this sort of these, these sorts of information flows, uh, whether it's a forecast or foresight, uh, reinforces the, the instinct of manufacturers to have, to always have a plan B on their supply chain. So what happens if? So they, they're not happy about having a single source of anything, no matter where that single source is from. So uh, if it's in a geopolitical sensitive area, that increases their risk. If there's a, a marker on the business side or the economic side that they get to see, then they start to take the, the logical actions you'd expect. How do I mitigate the risk? How do I keep this product line going in the face of, of, the, of this sort of challenge? So 
information would drive this. The other thing that will drive it is cost. Mm -hmm. uh, if somebody starts manipulating it for some reason at home or abroad, uh, that would get their attention very quickly. They'd start looking for other sources. Uh, intuitively, I, uh, I think my companies identify themselves as, as North American companies. So intuitively, they would think about sourcing closer just to avoid the cost of moving things farther. So all this, I think, contributes to a, a notion of, in, inside the electro industry of, of wanting to bring as much of this as close as you can and have multiple sources available. Mr. Conger. Chairwoman Murkowski, I, I would also add that if, if the free market system is allowed to work, if, if I can compete in this country with, with mines in other countries that have the same permitting horizons, roughly the same standards, then the, the supply will come from those that, that are most economically viable to do it. And in, in some of the cases that were pointed out by the Vice Admiral, if, if we had the opportunity to go search for and produce those minerals with certainty in this country, you've got the opportunity to actually increase the supply and drive the cost down. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it benefits us in many, many ways, uh, and it, it should be, you know, we, we, sh we should not be giving up a competitive advantage of these minerals that we have here at home because we've got such a difficult permitting horizon to to get through. Let me ask you all one more question here, and, and um, it's, it's uh, to, to any of you, you have reviewed the legislation that we have introduced here. Uh, one of the questions that was presented this morning, I think um, perhaps left a little bit of, of confusion about the, um, the bill itself and whether or not it weakens or um, um, removes any requirement uh, to, to, to provide for environmental safeguards. And I, I want to make sure that uh, um, it, it is very clear that the intent of the legislation, of course, is to, to, to do what we can to uh, allow for a more um, streamlined permitting system, but in no way to to pull the rug out from underneath any environmental requirements there. So, so to to any of you who may wish to jump in here, does do you believe that the bill weakens or or um, waives any of the requirements of existing environmental laws? Commissioner Fogels. Yeah, Senator. Um, yeah, uh, the state of Alaska and the Interstate Mining Compact Commission. We've reviewed the the draft bill as it, in its current form, and we do not believe that. We believe that it uh, provides the opportunity for the federal agencies to uh, evaluate how they do permitting, and uh, and it it it, uh, it provides them the uh, direction to improve their permitting process. In Alaska, we've spent a lot of time trying to improve our permitting process, and and a lot of people will take that to mean we're trying to. Uh, shortcut it somehow and uh, reduce protections, and that's not at all the case. Uh, with every mine project that we permit, we learn from previous mine projects, we learn from mine projects around the, around the planet, and we take what's worked well, what hasn't, and we build on the next mine project. So I think we're, we're in a process of continually improving our, uh, our permitting process, both environmentally and efficiently, and we believe this bill would do that. And do you think that any of the federal agencies would, would carry out the activities that it authorizes in a manner that's not environmentally responsible? I would certainly hope, hope not, Senator. Any other comments, uh, Mr. Conger? Senator Murkowski, uh, Deputy Commissioner, said, that, said it very well, but we, you're, you're not giving up environmental safeguards. We've, we've done it in other countries. It, it's all about a view to working through a, a process to get to an end point, not to just, just keep going through the process with various agencies all on their own different path. We, you know, the, the suggestions that have been made here is that we can coordinate that, we can eliminate duplication, delays that come from that, and, and have the same or better outcomes in less time, but certainly not less. Uh, safeguards. 
Admiral Cosgrave. I know this isn't the question you asked, but something that's very much on the minds of my members is uh, addressed in the bill, which is the workforce development. And I would congratulate you on that and, and, and just suggest that when we think about that, sort of the poster child becomes STEM, which almost by definition tends one to, to move in the direction of college and, and, and advanced degrees. Uh, but a challenge across the electro and medical imaging industry is the production workforce readiness too, which, which is a different part of the education spectrum. So uh, we commend the committee on, on addressing the criticality. This is a generational shift occurring in our industry, uh, and we, we are actively exploring any and all good ideas and opportunities to team with jurisdictions at all level and educators to see if we can get this right. Well, I thank you for bringing that up because it, it is a, an absolutely vital piece, not only to this legislation, but, but again, uh, when we look at, at our workforce that is out there, um, this is an area that I, I, I think is very important that we be uh, weighing in and, and addressing. I want to thank you uh, each for, for your contribution here this morning in discussing these issues. You know, we talk a lot uh, here in the Congress about um, made in America. We want everything to be made in America. We, well, we talk a lot about we don't like outsourcing. We want to bring everything back. And I think it's so important that we recognize that so many of the basics that we all start out with, with our phones or whatever, um, we, we wouldn't be able to utilize them were it not for the guts of them. And where do those guts comes, come from? It comes from, from the ground. And uh, if we have greater opportunity to take that from the ground here and do so in an environmentally responsible way, which as you have stated, Mr. Conger, we have higher standards here than, we, than, than elsewhere around the world. It seems we don't have a problem uh, taking it from another country where their environmental laws may be lax or their, their, uh, their work safety uh, or their labor laws are abysmal. But we will take the resource because we have to have it. We have to have it for our, for our computer technologies. We have to have it for our renewable energy projects. And we're just going to turn a blind eye to how it came to us. I don't think that that's responsible. I don't think that that's how we should be operating when we have that resource when we have that potential. So I think it's incumbent upon us. How are we going to define exactly what that potential is? How do we ensure that um, we not only know what is, what is in the ground, but how we use responsibly what we then take for purposes of recycling, how we are smart that way. I do think that we've got opportunities through our, our laboratories, through the through DOE, to, being, to, to doing more to build out these technologies that will allow us greater opportunities for recycling, uh, looking to what those alternatives are. But I'm also very cognizant. It's, it's not unlike the, the goal that we have for renewable energy in this country. I, too, would like to get us off of fossil fuel, but I know that we just can't flip that switch today and be there. And so when we talk about alternatives, we need to recognize that there's a there's a transition here, and it's going to be years, decades in, in, in coming. And so how, how, in the meantime, we allow for a level of, of security, energy security, is what we should be talking about. So the discussion here this morning, I think, is, is very, very important in moving us in that direction. I think what we're seeing from some of the states is, is good. Uh, we can work to replicate that, but let's push ourselves in terms of how, how we, uh, as a nation, do more for our own energy security initiatives. And it's not just when it comes to, 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 to oil and, and gas. Uh, it's what we utilize with our minerals. So know that this committee is going to be working on these initiatives. We will rely on you uh, as, as the experts that you have presented yourselves here today. Uh, Dr. Kimball, thank you for your leadership again at USGS. We've got a lot of work to do here, uh, but you're cl clearly very knowledgeable in the arena, and we look forward to working with you as we develop this moving forward. With that, we stand adjourned.